Oh, and one last thing, I'm going to get up and take a couple of pictures just kind of from the back of the room. So if you see me get up and take photos, uh, don't be alarmed. Okay? Just please. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Enjoy, everyone. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. All yours. So, good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. I haven't been here in years. I was thinking the last time I was here was probably in grade 11 or 12. I was dating a girl who went to her, had a membership at Hollyburn. I was lucky enough to come here for a swimming session or two. Uh, but it's been a minute, so it's been cool to be back here. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate Marta, your hospitality and sending us all up. I really appreciate that. Uh, so lessons learned. We're going to share a big idea with you today. A big idea, okay? But it's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, okay? It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters. It's not mine, that's Epictetus, this, this OG kind of guy here. Uh, this is going to be a through line from the talk today, okay? We're going to go through a lot of different things, a lot of different stories. It's going to be a through line we're going to carry through the talk today. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, okay? Now, who are you? I've heard a little bit about your story, about what happened here. Um, let me get away the slides because it's a bit distracting. Um, and that's tough. That is tough for sure. My talk today is about mental health. Uh, I want to show you a way through, a way to compartmentalize and to address and attack these, these uh, negative feelings or, or uncertainties in your life. But let me full stop and just say it's, it's tough to deal with, no doubt. Um, and I empathize a lot with you, so I just want to say I appreciate what you're going through. Uh, I've never been in the exact situation you're in now, but I've just recently had a friend of mine pass, and uh, <coughs> it's tough. Like, she was a good friend of mine, and, and she, um, she passed in London, and um, we had her funeral last week or two weeks ago, and it was quite a lot to deal with, so. And can I interrupt for two seconds? Yeah. I'm not sure if a lot of the group is aware, but um, a part of uh, why we decided to bring Dan in and why we decided to speak about mental health was we did lose a colleague in, uh, that worked in the kitchen in and uh, while he wasn't employed here um, at the time of his passing, it was something that did have a massive impact on a lot of people in this room. Um, and just in general, you know, any adversities that anyone is facing personally, that was the, the thought process behind this. So I, some people may have not been um, uh, privy to the information, but uh, it was something that got the ball rolling. And, you know, we wanted to bring uh, someone in to be able to help us guide us through those adversities and guide us through any obstacles that we face in our life, okay? Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. So that's my context for the talk today. Now, why am I speaking to you today? The call. So I did some brain scans. Well, a bit about me, first of all. Let me do that. I've had a brain injury, a brain hemorrhage in 2014. And... We'll go into that detail in just a second, but I did some brain scans maybe a month ago. I got test results back, and they were shockingly average. Shockingly average, which is, which is really good for a guy who's had a brain injury. Like, you're like, that's good. You show up with normal. But I was a bit miffed because I wanted to be a bit superior, a bit intelligent, a bit je ne sais quoi. And I thought, you know what? I've, I've done so well. I've recovered so much. I've got to be superior in some areas. Shockingly average across the board. Cool. That tells me one thing, though. The reason why I've been so successful is because my mindset's been so pure. It's been so focused, so driven. I've been able to stand on my tippy toes and what I wanted to do and ride that wave down. That's what's kind of shown me the way through here. Is like that's my mindset's got me through here, which is quite cool. And I want to share these lessons learned because if you haven't been through this, maybe you don't know this stuff. Not to say that I'm all wise and all encompassing. I mean. You said it, not me. But uh, there's some stuff here that they can be ashamed to leave these lessons learned on the sideline of life. I want to share them with you and show you way through because it's not always easy, but it's quite simple. It's not always easy, but it's simple. So this is what we're going to go through today. The first is my medical rap sheet. What happened to me? Do I don't look like someone who's had a traumatic brain injury? At least I hope not. I'll go through what that was, what the income is. And that's not me flexing saying, look at how... Where I am, how do like those apples kind of vibes? More so like so you buy into what I'm selling. Like, who are you? Why are you telling me anything about this? Like, who are you to talk about this? Well, let me show you what I've been through and maybe you can make your own mind about that. And we'll dive into goals. 
short-term and long-term goals, how to set these, how to acquire them, how to reach them, how to strive for them. We'll finish off with strategies and hacks. It's quite interactive. We're going to kind of have a whole bunch of slides, uh, pictures on the board. You pick a picture you want me to talk about a story, and we'll dive through that. It's quite casual, quite loose. Uh, so it gets more um, interactive as you go along. That makes sense. So before this happened, I was a healthy and active 20-year-old guy living and working in London. These are pictures of me when I lived in Sweden before I moved to London. Cruising through the docks in Malmo, Sweden on the left-hand side. I love that shirt. I'm not sure where it went. I love that shirt, though. Damn, it's a good shirt. And fishing up a neck of on the right-hand side. Nothing pike. They're horrible to eat. Um, but I started having these headaches that were horrible. And they got worse after a few weeks. I was taking painkillers like candy for those by having this pouty. The headaches would get so bad, my vision would turn spotty. And I would see stars or sometimes just go black. Black, like blinding headaches. On the tube one day, and the tube's how you get around in London. And picking up a microwave for my friend in Notting Hill, my vision went black. I got myself on the platform, waited three minutes, vision came back. Something's seriously wrong here. I went to a for the second time. They thought it was vertigo and they sent me home. But they told me if the headaches were to continue, I could always get my eyes checked in an optometrist. So they can run some tests there and see, you know, what's going on with your brain. The eyes are an extension of the brain. I was in the middle of the exam, the optometrist, Mr. Patel, he stopped the exam. He stopped it. Excused himself from the room and came back with a sealed envelope. He told me to go directly to Moorfield Hospital. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. He didn't say that part, but. Uh, directly to Moorfield Hospital, which I did. Well, sort of. I stopped at home first to grab a Jack Reacher book by Lee Childs. I figured I'd be in for the weight. Wanted something to read. Grabbed a phone charger and a bite to eat. They ran the same test that I sold me to Charing Cross Hospital. It turns out I had a dangerous buildup of pressure in my brain caused from a non-cancerous system ahead. It turns out I required emergency brain surgery. It turns out my world's about to change altogether. After a frantic back and forth with my folks in Canada, here's the last text message to my mom before we went to emergency brain surgery. I'll see you soon, mom. I think I'll have a new haircut next time I see you. Love, Dan. Now, this message is masking a lot of fear. I was terrified. Brain surgery, this could be curtains for me, right? Let's not let your last message be of a whimpering punk. A little bit of cheek, a bit of charm. There's a little bit of uh, fun. I wrote this message instead, but just know that if it wasn't so cool, I probably wouldn't show you. Now, mom responds back with, you'll be even cuter. Mom and dad sending hugs, you're in good hands. Remember that through line we talked about earlier, right? It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, right? It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters. Who would have thought my mom was still a philosopher? Don't, don't tell her. My mom was in the air flying to London on June 21st, 2014, when I was on the operating table. Something went wrong and had a massive bleed in the brain. Brain hemorrhage. They think the cyst burst from the operating table. Mom lands and finds I'm in critical condition. I was in a coma for four weeks. One, two, three, four. I was in and out of consciousness for months after this. Things were dicey, touch and go. When all was said and done, I was going to to walk, talk, and smile again. Now, we did a trial session of this for people at work, and they told me I need to make clear how low things got. So I'm going to get low, low, low. To say things were in a bad way would be an understatement. It was a constant battle in the intensive care and keeping me alive in those weeks. I was in critical condition and my parents were told I may not make it. Alarms constantly went off as blood pressure spiked to heart rate too high. Heart rate too high. It was pretty dicey. Here's a picture of me in the intensive care unit. My parents chose not to take photos of me from the front because I had a tube in my face. So I was told it wasn't my stronger look, so we got them from the back. Now, after I was stable enough, I was able to leave the intensive care unit, or as we called it on the ward, the ICU. I was transferred to chair class 411. Now, the game plan there was to learn how to get into a wheelchair in less time. 
My leg had frozen at an angle in the ICU. So I couldn't use it, I was in a wheelchair. It took 45 minutes, then 40, then 35, then 30, then 25, then 20. Arduous, difficult, grindy, chop wood carry water kind of vibes. I'm a very sporty guy, and losing that was super difficult. Now, eventually I was transferred to the Wolfson Rehab Center. I was learning how to walk. That was the game plan. In order to walk, I had to wear a splint over my left leg. Splint's a cast, kind of like, well, it is this. <laughs> Not kind of like this, it's like this. Now, you know something else in this photo that's quite subtle, so I'm going to point it out to you. Uh, some are going to say avant-garde. Some maybe fashion boards. Others may call this out for what it really was. That's oblivious. That eye patch. Does that look right to you? Don't think so. A bit upside down, eh? Uh, <coughs> that was, uh, mirrors weren't a big thing in the hospital, so you just kind of rocked in and went with it. I'll tell you a story of the split to show you how difficult this was to get this on and to start walking again, okay? The first time I wore this went through the night, no issue, no stress. This will be easy, I thought. This will be easy. Huh. What was that wrong? The second night after 20 minutes, it was painful. After 30 minutes, it was dreadful. After 40 minutes, it was unbearable. It's like a rat's nest had descended on my leg like a medieval torture chamber. Biting, scratching, clawing, and gnawing my leg. I buzzed the nurse to take it off. I can't deal with this, I said. But tomorrow, I told them, rack it up for an hour. I can do this. I'm a walker. I'm going to do this again. Rack it up for an hour. So the third night, they wrap wrapping my leg. Give me the clicker of the nurse call button. So the time I phone for one hour. And they over patrolled the Wilson Ward. Now the Wilson Ward's in L shape, so short on this side, long on this side. Short on this side, long on this side. And it smells like only a hospital room can smell. Sterilized, sanitized, segmentized. It's a chilling smell if you've ever smelled it before. After 10 minutes, the leg starts to smart. After 20 minutes, the leg's dreadful. After 30 minutes, the leg is unbearable. The rat's nest is back, biting, scratching, clawing, gnawing. This is insane. We're doing this for an hour. This is insane. I start passing the clicker back and forth. Now I have double vision from the brain injury, which is an ongoing thing I'm dealing with now, which means I get the pleasure of seeing two of you. So if I may, point out a few exceptionals. Aren't you looking lovely today? Thank you. Lovely lady over here. Doing the back of them very sharp, sir. And I get two of you. So think about how lucky I am. Bless. Uh, I'm passing the clicker back and forth, right? As the pain ratchets up, my throats get more enthusiastic. Till eventually, inevitably, I drop the clicker. It falls on the floor. Shit. Three and a half feet down the ground. I look over the bed. I see it lying there looking at me on the floor. Hard linoleum floor. If I drop down and grab the clicker, I might break my arm. 50-50 chance I've got a coin flip. Not the best odds. I change tack. I'm not, I'm pawing the split, but I can't do it. It's on the ankle, not at the hip. I'm not that flexible. I can't reach it. I'm trying real hard. Help! Help, I yell. The word of the Wilson's in L shape, right? Short on this side. Long on this side. Short on this side. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Long on this side, you're picking up. They're in the far end of the ward, they can't hear me yelling for help. So I decided, you know what? The solution to my problem's right there, the clicker's right there. I can just grab the clicker and this problem's all over. Flip the coin and see what happens. I drop down to grab the clicker. I smash down a massive crash, it's a yard sale. Blankets, wires, cables, it's all a go. The arm holds and I hammer the clicker. Expecting the nurses to come bursting into the room to come to a rescue. They kind of strolled in five minutes later. Oh, we're doing the floor, love. Wait till we're all here. Uh, that's a great accent, I know. Uh, yeah, let's not worry about that. I tell them, let's get a splint off my leg, please, and I'll tell you all about it. So, it's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, right? It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters. The reason why I'm telling you the story is I learned three lessons from this experience. The first is, I'll stop past the clicker back and forth. 
That seems pretty self-evident, but like, it takes me a little while to figure this out. Time, 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 time. The second was actually just my tip of the hip, not at the ankle. That way I can do this should this happen going forwards. The third, and probably most important, was let's always, always, always be solutions oriented here. No one's coming to save you during this process. You gotta save yourself. The clicker is there, let's get the clicker. That's the solution to my problem. It's key. With the help of the splint, I was able to start walking the hallways of the Wolfson. Zimmer frame, slow, arduous, climb. You're grinding your way through this. Every step reminds you you're alive. But it's a progress. Again, you know something else in this photo is quite subtle. I'll point it out to you again. Avant-garde. Fashion forward. Oblivious? That eye patch. Is that right to you guys? No. Again, mirrors weren't a big thing in the hospital, so the sets were good. Not a good look. Uh... We started building this up, we started building this up, we're grinding up. I moved up to the Ferrari after this. The Ferrari was a four-wheeled walk you could kind of waddle around quickly on. I'm picking up speed, I'm having fun. So in Ferrari racing red, so I called my Ferrari. Then we moved up to naked walks. Now what's a naked walk, you may ask? Relax, relax, relax. <laughs> on the other hard drive, my dear? It's one of these. I'm walking without sporter aids. I'm walking naked. The term kind of stuck. It was long road down to get to the naked walks, but man, I'm just happy to move. Then came time to walk in Tuton Broadway. Has anyone been to London? Anyone been to Tuton Broadway? One person, yes! <laughs> Never do I get someone who's been to Tuton Broadway. So you're going to know this. You can vet this out if you want. So Tuton Broadway is in South London, an area they call up and coming. In the UK, up and coming means. Dodgy as. Think loud sirens, drugs, gangs, dirty, act busy. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It's a full on visceral experience, right? I'm walking with a cane, I'm walking with an eye patch. I'm turning the corner on a Trudy Broadway for the first time. Immediately get slammed into by someone. I stagger back a few feet. Someone scurries past me on the right hand side. I thought I was done at the rats by this stage. Someone's been stabbed on the sidewalk. I'm thinking, this place sucks to walk, man. This is the worst place to learn how to walk in the world. Can't they see I'm trying to walk here? Can't they see I'm trying to walk here? And then one day my perspective shifted. Maybe this isn't the worst place to learn how to walk in the world. Maybe it's the best place. If I can walk here, I can walk anywhere. Now, Toon Bowen didn't change, right? As far as I'm aware, it's still up and coming today. And it went from the worst to the best in my mind and my mood reflected that. What are you looking at in your life that you're convinced is the worst? Convinced is the absolute worst. Hey, maybe it is. Maybe you can find a way to turn down the suck a little bit. Can you shift your perspective a little bit? It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, right? The reason why I'm telling this story is you can shift your perspective. When you change the way you look at the world, sometimes your world changes. Eventually, I got released from the Wolfson Rehab Center. Celebratory photo here. We had the Hutsu Christmas party. There's a Peaky Blinders thing. That's a good look. So I got the cap. No, it's a different cap. I have my friends Rob, Yo, rest in peace, and James. This is a great day. I was at a rehab and got to celebrate with my, with my mates. It's fantastic. Next, we did six months of rehab at home, occupational therapy, preparing for a return to work, Occu uh, for physical therapy. I'm building this back up slowly, but surely, right? I got back to work two days a week, then we went to three, half days. I'm not doing much. I'm looking at some emails, going for lunch, being social, back in the office. It's a good vibe. Which is landed off is a pretty fun place to be at work. I really enjoyed being back in the office. And then July 28, 2015, then... Then we had a bit of a setback. I was found unconscious in my flap on a moment. The chunk that's in my brain after the first brain injury had blocked leading to hydrocephalus or water on the brain. It's pretty serious business. I was resulting on myself an ambulance ride, another bad haircut, a new medic alert bracelet, which I still wear to this day here. Checked for a blocked VP shunt. And I woke up in that hospital bed 
in the hospital room with a beeping noise and a heart reminder. Beep, beep, beep. What happened? What happened? Well, then you had a second brain injury. Brain injury. You got the blockage, don't worry, but yeah, you had a second brain injury. All my problems washed away. Yeah, we got the blockage. You're okay. You're good to go. I've been working for a year, man, and you have it to work. A year. Chop wood, carry water. Get myself into a position where I get back to work, and then this happens? This looked more like this. The depths of the human experience. I described my recovery like a W. So the first setback is the first dip of the W, the recovery. And the second dip is not where the first one was much lower. All the way to the bottom, the depths of the human experience, I call this. All your hopes and dreams just snickered at. You thought you had a chance, but back to work and everything. Hey, ha, ha, ha. I can't tell you how difficult this was. I'd already done rehab. I wasn't entitled to go back through that. I'd do this at home, on my own. This was the most difficult thing I've ever experienced in my life. The first one was a joke compared to this. After you've been working for a year and get the carpet ripped from underneath you, man, that tells you how you're really doing. I was devastated by this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I figured out that it's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, right? It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters. So I decided to keep my mindset pure. My mindset is everything right now. If I think it's shit, then it's shit. If I think it's not shit, it's not shit. You've already done rehab, so you know how to do this better next time. I've got that free pass, so I know how to do this better. I slowly start building this back up, right? But this took a good week to kind of go stop the woes me pity spiral going on here, okay? But it, it, it happened. But because I'm very conscious about how I thought about this. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to the matters, right? There's an overview when things happened. I'll read it out because it's a bit small. June 21st, initial brain hemorrhage. July 4th, the tracheotomy. So tracheotomy was taken out. Uh, there's a little scar there, but to be honest, I've got a few other hits, so it's not the biggest scar. August 25th, breathing tube was removed. It took me two weeks to start talking again after it was removed. The naked walk was November 2nd. Second setback was late July. In mid-October, I returned to work the second time. This is kind of give you an overview of when things happened, and hopefully gives me some street cred in, in the Auburn eyes. Uh, yeah. So, Dale Carnegie. Feeling sorry for yourself in your present condition is not only a waste of time, but the worst habit you could possibly have. I felt sorry for myself. For sure. This isn't fair. This isn't fair. But, like, no one cares if not fair. No one's coming to save you, man. You can't get down the pity spiral. You can't be woes me about this. It's not fair. You're right. It's not fair. But it's happened. <coughs> Worrying about something that's happened and saying, why did it happen? It's only a waste of energy, but it's the worst habit you could possibly have. No one's coming to save you. You've got to pick yourself up by your And How do you get back to that? How do you build this up? That's what the second part of the talk is all about. We'll build you back up, don't you worry. So I think about how fortunate I was to have this happen in London. Best healthcare for neuroscience in the world. Free. The job it did to me. I had a life to press play on. The weekend before this, I was in Lithuania where a certain day outcome would have been different. Actually, much to my surprise, Lithuania is a very beautiful and modern country. Vilnius is a gorgeous city. Check it out in the summertime. The winter kind of sucks. Gorgeous city. But I think about how fortunate I was to have this happen here in London. Or in London. So, motivation. This is a key part of my vibe and something I probably should have checked the first mark but we're going to go into this now because we're already live, so we're going to that. But this is Noel Gallagher from Oasis, a real troublesome guy. This, in the UK, essentially means this. Fuck off. Up yours. This is motivation for me, zero to one. Zero to one means zero on the ground, one standing up. The way the nurse got me talking again, which took me down to the park, there was kids playing football across the park, soccer. 
And she goes, Dad, these kids across the park, they don't think you're good enough to talk. Yeah, they don't think you're good enough to talk. I found my voice. And I yelled some profanities, I'll spare your listeners here across the park, at them to let them know, how dare you say I can't speak. But don't judge where your motivation comes from. Proving someone wrong got me off the ground. It got me speaking again. It got me here in front of you today because you don't think I can do this? I can't tell you how many times people have been like, dismissive or, or put you down with us. like, cool, I'm going to come back and beat you. Did anyone else, did anyone hear the last dance by Michael Jordan? Couple, then four, yeah, cool, cool, cool. So let me be honest and clear here. I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan, okay? I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan. I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan. But I'm not not comparing myself to Michael Jordan, right? You notice how he motivated himself in that series? Nice game, Mike. Cool. I'm going to torch you for 50 points and I say, just isolate me and you. I'm going to bury you. I got that inside me in space. You also notice something else in that documentary that was quite profound for me. I saw a lot of myself in Michael Jordan, but I saw how angry and bitter and jaded he was as an old man. You notice that? Interviews, he's like, well, this guy said this, this guy said that. Like, dude, you got billions of dollars. You're a competitor through and through, but like, he can't let it go. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that angry, bitter guy. So I've now transitioned my motivation to now service. Lending the hand, giving talks. Sharing my perspective. Service. Helping people allows me to kind of let the motivation carry through. You know something with motivation is when I try to beat you, when I'm trying to prove you wrong? Once I prove you wrong, the motivation is gone. Like it never existed. Like poof, it evaporates. When I'm service, when I'm helping you, I'm invested in your success. Your success is my success. My success is your success. It maintains and provides itself longer duration, one tenth. So this is where I'm at now. I'm pretty happy about it. I'll be honest with you, I still get fired up when people tell me I can't do something. And it's a big part of my vibe. But don't judge your motivation because if you find yourself down in a dark hole, I don't want you to think, hey, Dan told me motivation was to come from service and, and all this. Like, no, no, no. It very much came from this initially, okay? I've consciously transitioned to this part after the fact. Now, goals. Goals are a part and point of my vibe, and I want to talk about two goals with you. One short-term, one long-term, okay? The first is stairway to heaven. Stairway to heaven. So I've been at Wolfson Rehab Center for two months. I have been home in five months. Chance for a trial home visit came up. We're looking forward to a weekend back at home, but the only thing that's stupid between me and a chance to have a weekend back at home were the stairs to get back to my flat in Hammersmith. As my mom put it, there must be 100. No, there's actually 44 steps. 44 steps. Stood between me and a week, chance of a weekend away, a weekend out of the Drew Hospital. 44 steps didn't sound like much, but keep in mind I was fresh out of a wheelchair. That seemed like a rather tall order. We had to the stairs in the hospital, taking on little chunks, building the way up to 44. 44 was all I needed to a weekend away, a weekend out of the Drew Hospital. I set the school for myself, or rather it was set for me. Come hell or high water, I was making up those 44 steps back home. Over the course of a few weeks, I built up the 44 steps. and was about back home. This is the last leg of those 44. I made the best, the best BLT I've ever had at the top of those 44 steps. you got to pick small targets, work towards them. 44 steps are a lot for me. Pick your target, work towards them. Scheme. More in France. I love this shot. I was on the chairlift coming down across the mountain. I saw this on the left-hand side. I grabbed my camera, emptied my whole backpack on the chairlift. Precariously balanced there. We'll see if it goes. And snap this photo. I love this shot. It borders France and Switzerland. Spend the morning in France. Have some raclette in the afternoon in Switzerland. Back to France. Leave me for some Mapare ski. It's a pretty rad experience. Buddy Freddy launched him into an air. Fika and Twix in the hill. Fika and Twix in the hill. So Fika is Swedish for coffee break and something I picked up while studying in Sweden. We wake up early, make a pot of coffee, pack it in a thermos. Bring a Twix to the hill because that was a treat. And park it in the sunshine, it's pretty cool.
Friday night there'd be a little mound drop in the background. When was the last ski trip I was on? It was in 2012. We're with a big group of people. We broke off into a splinter cell to ski together. Skiing in a big group is no fun. Now, this is a much more relaxed approach to skiing than I was accustomed to. Real chill. Lots of groomers. Go over lunch. A few countries in the hill. Some contacts in the school. I used to ski race. Three days a week on the hill. Massive white boots were gone. Also, I instructed after uni for a season. I was comfortable in how these to attack the vertical. I remember working on the even bars in my rehab team. Now, these are just what they sound like. Even bars you hold when you're unstable on your feet. I was still in a wheelchair at the stage, and they asked me what I was most looking forward to get back to doing. What was I most looking forward to get back to doing? Thought about it. I just played everything softball, volleyball, soccer, skiing, hockey. What would be the most difficult to get back to doing? Skiing would be the most difficult. Balance, core strength, depth perception, double vision, which I mentioned earlier, would make things interesting. Gauge and obstacles of speed. If I could ski again, I'd have to be in a pretty way physically about it. I was going to ski and I told them. They paused, not in agreement. Okay, they said. But I'm sure it was a simple exercise designed to get me thinking about future goals has been burned into the back of my mind and split I'm going for. That laid back approach to skiing, but using a more signal, is something I'll need to get used to when I back on the slopes. Speaking Twix breaks while crushing some groomers is something I'll need to get used to. And I was asked when I wanted to make this happen. I said 2022. For those of you keeping score at home, that happens to be this past winter. So pretty late in the season into March. All the skis in the shop, they get waxed, they get sharpened, they couldn't adjust my bindings. Those are too old, they couldn't work on those. Cool, 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 I thought. No stress. I'm not planning any of those too much anyways. I took a stab on March 31st when we landed on the sun. Gorgeous day. Gorgeous day. When you're skiing in the spring, you want sunshine. If it's raining on the base, you're raining on the slopes. It sucks. A hot in here. The base of the hill, that base of the Grossmont is super scary. Has anyone been up Grossmont? Big and cool. So the base of Cross Mountain Super Sky Ride. It's a hack that's going to revolutionize your mind, okay? Be the last one that goes on the Super Sky Ride. That way, when the doors close behind you, you can rest your skis and your poles on the doors. Have your hands free to go up. It's an OG hack, and I felt like I belonged on the hill. It was great. Now, we're on the gun ride going up the mountain, right? Over the first tower, big forts, big back. I'm thinking to myself, it's going to come back, right? It's got to come back. Now, if you could all do me a favor, close your eyes, please. Just for a minute, I promise, close your eyes. Feel a nip of cold in your cheeks, okay? Not a lot, but enough to let you know you're at altitude. We're going to dock at the station. You walk through the station with your gear. Clomp, 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 clomp. Into a wall of sunshine. A beautiful bluebird day. Beautiful bluebird day. Big inhale. Smell the pines, the snow, the fresh air. You're on the slopes. It's great. Down the stairs, clang, clang, clang onto the snow. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Back on the slopes. Open your eyes, please. Did a few runs with the boys, Andrew and RJ. And then we did this. Super jacked on that one. That was awesome. <coughs> Best day I've had since the brain injury was that day right there. To tell you, I thought this was possible to be a lie. This was through and through a mood shot goal. Something bold to aspire to. Something, if I could only get back to doing this, wouldn't that be something? And there I am skiing. When you have goals you're working towards, stuff you're aiming at, stuff you're shooting for, it's holding you back. And I'm able to walk, talk, or smile. Now let's dive into some hacks. Give me one second here.
the hacks. These are ways to kind of improve your life, and they're action-oriented, so you can use them tomorrow. Take on board what works for you, but take, take one on board. I'm not trying to be prescriptive here, telling you you should do this, you should do that. When someone does that to me, I tell them, hey, two for the road, brother. Uh, but these work for me, so maybe one will work for you, okay? The first one I have here is make your bed. Seems like a basic, mundane task. Growing up, I never made my bed. Never made my bed. I make my bed every morning now, religiously, for two main reasons. The first is the room will look tidy. If you mess it, the bed is made, the room will look tidy. The second is the first task you accomplish in the day. You pave the way for more success. The last thing you do in the day is get into bed. Hey, I accomplished it in the morning. Tim Ferriss says if you win the morning, you win the day. Swim. So I swim quite a lot now. Uh, three days a week normally. It's a great way to get exercise, low impact. Uh, I swim because it's a great way to kind of get out of my head or into my, into my head and into my body. Focus on the lengths. No worry about the traffic, the music, the outside influence. Save those pesky backstrokers. Those backstrokers. Don't get me started on them. This could be anything. This could be a walk. This could be a gym. Any sort of vibe. In fact, I was supposed to go for a walk this morning, but I didn't get a good sleep, so I sacrificed that for sleep. Sleep is my one all, be all, end all. But exercise, move your body, move follows action. I'm a big believer in this. After you're done working out, getting the sweat on, you don't want to have a shower. I hope. I've got two hacks for you, okay? The first is buy eucalyptus oil from Amazon or whatever you buy oil from, I don't know. If you drop this in your shower, you're transported to a spa. You're welcome. You're welcome. The second hack is end the shower cold. Nothing crazy here, one to three minutes. This will give you a giddy up and go kind of vibe. It's gonna suck, embrace the suck. You do this, I guarantee you you have a better day. It takes some getting used to, I'll be honest with you, it's a bit abrasive to start with, but in the summer in Vancouver, it's pretty basic. In the winter, it gets a bit shockingly cold. Do you guys have a cold plunge here, Martin? Here at the pump down. <laughs> um, anyways, end the shower cold, one to three minutes, you're sorted for that. Meditation. So I meditate every morning for 20 minutes, which sounds like a big number. I started with two minutes in the morning, next week I did four, then I did six, then I did eight, I ramped up to this stage. This is the best habit I picked up since the brain injury. The best habit I picked up since the brain injury. I read a book, Tim Ferriss. Has everyone heard of Tim Ferriss before? Yep. Uh, Tribe of Mentors or Tools of Titans. 80% of the top performers do some sort of mindfulness practice every day. I want to be in this group. What's her meditation? It's tough because, you know, don't think of a pink elephant. It's kind of tough to not think of a pink elephant, right? But just breathe, man. I just put on rain music and I just breathe. And I get my decks in a row. Two minutes for one week, four minutes next week, six minutes week after that, ramp it up gradually. Aim small, miss small. Build it up, but do it. Best how would I picked up, okay? How to foster a resilient mindset. So I think I've always been somewhat resilient. I mean, there's some stories later on we'll go into about resiliency, but like, I've always kind of been a bit stubborn a bit. I'm going to make this work. Resilience is kind of the vibe. But you can build this muscle in yourself. How do you do this? You keep promises to yourself. You show yourself an undeniable stack of proof that says you do what you say you're going to do. You do what you say you're going to do. So that can be going for a walk for one block for one week. Next week you do two blocks, then three blocks, then four blocks. Before you know it, you've got an undeniable stack of evidence that says you do what you say you're going to do. Now when something bad happens, you're like, hey, I can do what I say I'm gonna do, I'm resilient. But prove yourself that you can do this. Outwork your self-doubt. You can build this muscle for sure. But you've got to try, you've got to start small. One block, then two blocks, then three blocks, then four blocks. Meditation, two minutes, then four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes. You can foster resiliency for sure. So we're gonna stop here for an AMA. Uh, AMA is ask me anything. So we talked about a lot of stuff in the background hacks. I'd love to answer a few questions now. We can do some more questions at the end as well if you want. 
Or we've got some more hacks we can go through as well. But I'm going to pause for some questions here. Have a think. What's it like being in a coma? How do you learn how to walk again, talk again, smile again? Nice cap down. Is it from England? It is from England. Um, have a think about questions, guys. Any questions you have here? Brave souls. Brave souls. When you said you uh, went back to work after your first uh, injury, what were you doing for? Thank you. Uh, implementation specialist at Hootsuite. Which is a great job. I loved it. Because essentially you're post-sales. So they've already bought the tool. They're there for the honeymoon period. Setting them up, training them. Worked with clients in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, EMEA. So big spread, like Italian clients to African clients to Saudi Arabia clients, like widespread of working cultures and different backgrounds. But when I came back to work, man, I was not exactly a contributing force of the team. I was looking at some emails, spacey as, as anything else, but like it was, uh, I worked there until this past summer. I actually got let go from that job. Part of the corporate restructuring, there was 400 people that got axed that day. I was one of those on the wrong side of a spreadsheet. That's why I'm able to do the speaking gig now, because I decided, you know what? Screw it, let's become a speaker. And every day since that day, I've been working towards being a speaker. So it's been one of the best things that's happened to me. That was the job I had up until this summer. That was all in, in London, one year in, in, in Vancouver. But yeah, thank you for the questions. Please. You said how you felt right after that ski run. How did you feel 10 seconds before? Confident. I had visualized it so many times. Like I meditate every morning and like I visualize three pumps of the poles and do a left hand turn. One, two, three. Remember an old hack as an instructor, put your poles in your hands. And that way you keep your upper body still and your lower body active. It's like a very stupid way to visualize it, but like it helped me understand the moment I wanted to do. And it was all there, man. It was all there. Like I was ripping down that slope and I was like, I was, I was fantastic. First time I've been fast and since the brain injury. I used to drive motorcycles, ski, ski race, drive cars. Like I love going fast. I think it's taken away from me because I can't see. I still see two of you, right? Like it's quite difficult. And the ski thing was probably not. Hey, Dan, you should try going skiing again. I was like, no, it's probably a bad idea. I bought a new helmet to appease the people that were worried about that. But, like, I'm sure they're all terrified about this. But I was pretty confident, like, going down there. Like, it was, I visualized it so much in my head. The best experience I had since the range was skiing. Thank you for the question. The seven room? Please. I was just going to ask, uh, <coughs> you were talking about prioritizing your sleep. And yeah. uh, is there any good hacks that you have that you notice to like get a better sleep? Or? So I got a whoop strap. Oh, you use the whoop. Okay. Love the whoop strap. Love the whoop strap. Not a plug for them, but buy a whoop. <laughs> uh, I go to bed every day around ten o'clock, pretty religiously. I'll gauge how I'm feeling in the morning. Sleep takes priority over everything. I'm not like you said you're gonna work out. You gotta work out. If I have stuff like shit, I'm not gonna work out. Sleep, because if I don't sleep, I'm, I'm useless. And I knew this was today, and I wanted to be sharp for Marta, the team here. Uh, so I prioritize sleep. But, <coughs> I mean, I do take magnesium occasionally. I do take some tea. Room's cool, dark. Uh, I don't know. Does anyone else have a whoop strap here? What is that? I don't know. No. I use it. Whoop strap. Boom. Uh, it's a tracker that tracks your strain, rest, and recovery. Tracking your phone in an application, it's great. Uh, I think I paid up for five years for this thing. I love it so much. I track it every day. The new strain count with the workout is pretty cool. Have you tried that? I, think I actually haven't worked for a while, but I, I, I wore it for a couple of years consistently. I love this thing. Yeah. And I'm not like a nerd, like a, a tech nerd guy, but like I love this. Every morning I'm like checking how to sleep, how to recover. How's my strain total for the day going? It's a great way to kind of get into your body and check this out. One more question from this side of the room. Brave souls over here on this side of the room. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> one question. One question we'll move on. I promise you that. One question from this side of the room. Please, Marta. So, 
getting back on the ski hill was one of your goals. What's your next goal? Thank you. Uh, TED, TED stage. Um, I've got a TED talk that I give as well. Not a TED talk, but like the talk I propose to bring to TED. I've done that for smaller segments of time, like 20 minutes, 18 minutes. Uh, that's got so many stories as well. I'm trying to get that refined and tightened up. That's my next goal for sure. TED Talk, so thank you for that. You alleviated you the pressure on this group here. All right, so this is a slide. This is a bit of a dumpster fire. My graphic designer would be absolutely appalled that I'm using this in a presentation. She's not here. So each one of these pictures just represents a story that I can talk about. Have a look. Soak up this beautiful slide because I built it myself, as you can tell. And just point out or yell out a picture you want me to describe a story about, and I'll tell you all about it. Any other that catches your interest, what does this mean? You don't have to raise your hand, just yell it out. Russell Springs. Every time? That's first awesome. <laughs> this is controversial, so giddy up. This is going to get real, real, real fast here. Russell Sprouts, I hate him. Absolutely hate Brussels sprouts. They're the worst fruit or vegetable ever made, okay? This represents the worst memory I've had in the medical space, okay? So thank you for bringing it up. The worst memory. Thank you for bringing that up. I did interviews for these, these new doctors. Um, they come to the house and we chat about, I was a new doctor, what should I take on board here? What should I take on board? And the worst memory I had in the hospital was in the optometrist office, and she goes, track this pen down, let me know when you can't see, but don't move your head. And you go, cool, cool, cool. She tracks it down, I'm like, well, I can't track it down because I've got double vision. When that goes away, I should be able to track that just fine, though. She goes, oh, that's not gonna go away. Excuse me? Yeah, that's not going away. She just mentioned it like I should just know this. And like, I don't, I guess I can't blame her, like someone should have told me, but like, this, this for life. I'm like, cool, that, that's my life, man. Like, you're just saying this bloody, like, this is my life. I'm living with delusion now for life? Like, I can't tell you how hard of a gut punch that was. Like, I, I almost, like, it, it ravaged me, man. It ruined me. It's so this, like, delusion is not easy to deal with, right? Seeing two of you as much as awesome as that is, is a lot to take on board, right? But she treated me as a patient first and a person second. I told the doctors, don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Always a person first and a patient second. Conversely, I'll, I'll get you up, let the valve off here. That, that meets with the best memory here with this guy here. He did my doctor, Jens Fools, for the first time. He goes, Dan McQueen. Yep, over here. Walk over with my cane and my eye patch. He goes, Dan, in front of the whole room, right? Dan, I read your file. I thought you'd be a wreck. And I go, Jens, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I love that story for two reasons. First, it shows how remarkably wit quick-witted and charming I am. And the second is it shows that we treat me as a person first and a patient second. A person first and a patient second. Always a person first and a patient second. You can give me the worst news in the world if you show respect as a person. Don't ever tell me, like, oh, this is for life, you just know this. Like, yeah, this is my life, man. That was the best room we had in the hospital. So we relieved the pressure for you there. But yeah, thank you for that. Any other stuff on here you're interested in? The frog. Harry Frog. So an odd image, isn't it? The Harry Frog. Why do you have a Harry Frog? I don't know. I was in the lift one day, coming back from uh, leaving the work with my HR manager. She goes, Dan, why do you have these bags? I swim on Monday mornings for work. So like start off my week and she goes, oh, you swallowed the hairy frog. And I go, excuse me? She goes, yeah, you swallowed the hairy frog. And I go, that's not a thing. So Harry the dog, drinking after a bender and swallowing the frog. If you had to swallow a frog, you do it first thing in the morning. You had, like if you're boozing and you want to keep it going, you hair the dog, right? Just combine the two. Nonsense. I built her a mug that's like this. It's got this picture on it. It's a swallowed hair frog on the back. Hashtag swallowed the frog. And I gave it to her to represent how much smack she talked. This represents momentum. If you have a difficult tasks, you want to do it first thing in the morning, it's swallowed the hair frog from this day onwards. 
Hashtag small there frog. I'm probably the only guy on Instagram that does that one. Uh, now, this also parallels with the building blocks, the, 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 the fixie biker. Well, mental is a big part of rehab, right? When you're with a brain injury, you've got a short wick. My battery's about 75%. You've got to compound this stuff. So come home from work, throw a load of laundry in right away. Get dinner going right away. Don't sit down and stop it. Keep it rolling. Keep it rolling. Keep, keep it moving just a little bit. Just turn over that laundry just to keep adjusting the stove a little bit. Momentum's a big part of this vibe. The momentum's huge for me. Excuse me. And I'll do that every day now. Just keep things going. Because to stop from a dead stop is so difficult. That's why I always try to keep things rolling. Thank you for bringing that up. Next one. Choppers. Fatigue. Sorry, the what? Fatigue. The, 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 the mouth, the teeth. Oh, the teeth, okay, sorry. Retainer. Retainer, sorry. No, it, it's, 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 uh, it's uh, Invisalign, so you can't see it. I didn't have the joy of wearing Invisalign. No, I had to wear this with full pride across my teeth here. But the retainers, so I, used to, I have retainers, I wear it every night. My retainer broke for a while, and it created a massive gap in my front teeth. It's quite, it's quite self-conscious about it. Came back to Vancouver, my, my mom's friends in orthodontist, and she goes, oh, I can fix that for you. Give me the retainers. And she fixed it. And now I wear my retainers every day, because guess what? It's fixed my teeth. Build these retainers in your life. Stuff you know you should do that will fix the thing that you know it will fix. You can't expect your teeth to be fixed if you don't wear the retainer, so I wear it every day now, without fail. So the retainer represents just do the thing you know you're supposed to do. It's as simple as that. The retainer can't work if you don't wear it. If you wear it, guess what? Also, on that note, um, charcoal toothpaste. My teeth are white. Give it a try. I stand behind that 100%. Give one another, you let's see. Uh, the Deadpool, that's, Deadpool that's, that's good. So, this represents be the hero in your own story. So, I love Deadpool. He's my hero. He's kind of like an avant-garde hero. Uh, avant-garde hero, that's not a thing, but it's... He's, he's a hero in some capacity, right? So, be the hero in your own story that wakes up today in the hospital bed You've had a brain hemorrhage, you can't walk, talk, or smile. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna act on this? How are you gonna react to this matter? Be the hero in your own store, what the hero do? Wake up early, go to the gym, meditate, cold shower, exercise, be good to people, treat people as you want to be treated. Be the hero in your own story. So let's see. Got one of there you like to see? Is that boat even boat face? It's the boat on the left. Oh icebreakers. Icebreakers. Like, oh, icebreakers. But I love your heads up. Icebreaker. So this is not like a let's break the ice and have a social conversation. Icebreakers are what I used to get around London. So London is quite a busy city. Who's been to London again? Hands up, please. Quite a few of you. Okay, cool. Uh, so the circus are just that, a bloody circus. So you want to find an icebreaker. Someone who's walking your direction and you want to slide them behind them. Let them break the ice for you. Let them do the oncoming traffic, and you just walk right behind them. You find a, um, a stroller, a couple, someone with a weird gait, walking all awkward and googly. Walk behind them. Let them break the ice for you. This takes a dramatic amount of strain off your vibe. With the brain injury, I said my battery is about 75%. Everything I do drains the battery. This helps me maintain the battery in a difficult situation. Walking in Piccadilly Circus and Oxford Circus is a gong show. Absolute dumpster fire. Find an icebreaker. So like next time you're down, I mean, Vancouver's pretty, pretty chill in this capacity, but like maybe downtown sometime, walk behind someone, let them break the ice for you. Use the hack. Let it use, let it work. What about you? Do you have one of those you'd like to see? Put you on the spot. The axe, lovely one. Thank you for bringing that up. So the axe represents chop wood, carry water. When I get a bit frazzled about not sure what to do, like, I'm starting this speaking business now. 
um, what door you want to wake up. And don't, don't get all flustered in your head that you chop wood, carry water. Do the work. Trust the process. The process is what I'm talking about with chop wood, carry water. Respond to podcast interviews. Reach out with business pitches for speaking gigs. Go to the gym, meditate, cold shower, like the process, every day the process. Armor up, giddy up. Every day I wake up, I've got that morning routine now where I make my bed. Shower, cold shower, work out, say today. Um, but the routine's the same because I'm getting the process of what I'm investing in. Not the outcomes, what it is, like trust the process. And like you'll have days where like, this morning I woke up like, well, maybe you should do something different today. Like, why would you do something different today? Like, this is the day you got to be on your shit. <laughs> Routine based entirely. Trust the process. Find a routine that works for you and do that every day if it works. With some exceptions, obviously, but like trust the process, right? Just remote. Anyone else want to hear another one over there? What else have we covered? Please. Monopoly. Monopoly, that's a good one. So, everyone's played Monopoly. I played last year with my mom, dad, and brother. And. I will be honest with you. I Googled how to win a Monopoly before I played with them. Which is like kind of cheating, but kind of like they could have done the same thing too, right? <laughs> but, you know, and it told me like, you know, avoid the railroads, avoid the utilities, like don't fall prey for like park place, the flashing stuff that's on the board. Like focus on like small monopolies and build it up. Cool, cool, cool. We're playing Monopoly. A few rounds go around, like, land on, you know, railroad. Like, no, I'll pass. Thank you. It's okay. Land on Park Place. Park Place. The best spot you could possibly have. You got to buy that, Dan. I'll pass. Like, do you know how to play Monopoly? I'm like, yeah, cool. I don't know how to play it. <laughs> I got a Monopoly on the yellow ones, like Barton Gardens and uh, yellow ones, right? Not, not a prestigious area by any stretch, but a Monopoly. And I could buy all the houses and hotels I wanted. You land on that spot, you owe me 1200 bucks a stop. That shut them up pretty quick. My brother tells me this is the most comprehensive game Monopoly's ever seen played. I rinsed the floor with them. I mopped the floor with these guys. And this represents like the, this plan of having this recovery. I picked a plan, and you got to stick with your plan. You're going to have stuff coming in that's like flashy. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Park place. Railroads, like, no, no, you know the plan. Avoid that crap. Focus on what you want to do. And guess what? You hold the nerve, you smash it. You hold the nerve, you smash it. There's a whole bunch of stuff pawning you to like, hey, look at me, look at me, I'm important, I'm important. No, 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 you know it's important. Focus on what's important and follow through with the plan. Hold your bloody nerve. Monopoly is a great one. IFTTT, if this, then that. Uh... This is uh, an old ha app that was big a while ago. Like if it's like if someone posts to my Facebook page, tweet it out to my tweet it out to my Twitter account. A basic app that like if this then that. So it automatically does this stuff for you. I've got these rules for life now. So 25 degrees and below, wear trousers, pants, jeans. 25 degrees above, wear shorts. If this then that. Uh, we're taking the tube, right? Yellow line, yellow signal, delay signal. Hold the plan. It's faster to hold the plan with the yellow line than it is to change. If it's red, then you've got to change tack entirely. If this, then that. Create these rules so you're not thinking about this stuff, right? You want this a way that you're happy about. What else now you want to hear about? Race horses. Heading on the ponies. Okay, cool. So, going on the tube with my friend Manal after work, I was obnoxious. I was obnoxious as anything else. I get in the tube and I go, yeah, yeah. And I'd stand in front of some people I thought would be getting off at the stops ahead. When you can sit in the tube, you can take the bandwidth off. Like the icebreakers, the battery, conserve the battery, right? I got a couple of racers over here, Manal, number one and two. I'd stand in front of them, wait for them to get off, and I'd sit down. I gamble on who I thought was getting off first based on their attire, based on where we were going. If you can sit in the tube, you can save a lot of battle. It makes a remarkable difference for your body. Um, Fast and Furious. I've got, I'm going to tell you the fun story about this, not the actual hack, because I think this, this story is pretty fun. 
my friend Manal from work, and the first time I met her, I go, you know, Ukraine small talk banter, like, what's your favorite movie? I, I don't know, I hate this question. Don't ask me this question. What's your favorite movie, Manal? Send me your favorite movie. I don't know, movies like Fast and the Furious. The Fast and the Furious is your favorite bloody movie? Movies like Fast and Furious. Cool. What followed was two years of constant, I'll take the tuna, no crust. If you're not first, you're last. Text into group chat. Fast and Furious is my favorite movie? Okay, cool. Her wedding came up. Um, we bought her uh, a gift from the Hootsuit offices. I was made aware that Fast and Furious had a live show in London after her wedding. So I proudly said to the group, I'll take care of Manal's gift. Not, not, not cheap. Tickets were probably like two, three hundred quid. I bought all the tickets for her and her husband to go to Fast and Furious. She had to sit there and tell her family, where are you going today, Manal? She goes to see the Fast and Furious show. And Why are you going to see that? My friends at work bought this. Don't they even know you? I told them my favorite movie was Fast and Furious. So she had to go to that because it was a gift from the office. She said it was absolutely horrid. <laughs> but it's a memory. It's a story. And it's tough shit. Guess what? I'm buying you Fast and Furious tickets. Uh, that's all of them on this page. Let me go to the next page just quickly. So there's a few more stories here. Maybe we'll just do, uh, we have 15 minutes left, so yeah? We have a few more we can do here. Is there anyone else going to hear? Yeah, discipline. Discipline, okay, cool. So, discipline equals freedom. Jocko Willink. You ever heard of Jocko Willink? Yeah. So, big believer in this. Um, discipline allows me to do what I want to do. Do stuff that I don't like doing, but do it like I love it. There's no negotiation. I meditate every morning. I work out when I can. But I'll work out like so many days a week. So like I swim three days a week and I'll work out three days a week. It's quite a, quite a full-on regimen, but it's like I need to do those things. It initially went from vanity to now sanity. I worked out for my, my own feeling of importance, now like I need to do it to keep myself sane because otherwise there's too much extra energy in my vibe. I can't keep that unless I burn it off. So discipline equals freedom is a huge part of my vibe now. We'll just have the room over here. Where are we going here? Tetris. Tetris. So, that's a good one. I haven't seen this one in a while, so thank you. Tetris, the way a brain drew is described to me is your brain is like an interconnecting highways that interconnect. But the brain drew is now an issue on the fast highways. You take the back roads to do everything. Like I was told how to dry myself in the bloody shower. Like everything is just difficult and not easy. And like, how do I dry myself in the shower again? Oh yeah, you dry yourself like this. Everything is difficult and trying and, and difficult. But like after you do it a few times, you pick up speed. I told the game like Tetris would help form new patterns in my brain. So I played Tetris on the tube and write down my scores to see how I did. These are widely dis like different, like, you know, I do 25 and I do like 400. Big spreads in my mental capacity here. The Tetris is a way that it kind of visualizes, like, improving my lot. Love them there. Thank you for bringing that up. Tent. I'll tell the story. So I mentioned I was resilient beforehand, right? When I moved to Sweden to do my master's in 2011, 2010, 2011, I moved there kind of on a whim, bought tickets to the airport. It was not really well planned. I'm kind of fly with my pants. And I arrived in Malmo, which is Malmo Festival. It's like the biggest bloody party event of the whole season. Bought a, booked a hostel for like a week. Cool. I'm grabbing a towel at the hostel, at the front desk, like two days before I go. So, oh, I see your, your stay ends like on Tuesday. Nice to have you here. Well, I probably just renew, like, you know, I don't really have a place to go yet, so like, I'll probably just renew it, that's okay. Actually, we have a hard strip limit, one week per person. I'm like, cool, so that's like a non-negotiable? He goes, yeah, no, we can't, we can't do that, it's non, can't bend, sorry. 
I'm like a broke student in Sweden being told, hey, Dan, your spot runs out in two days. And I'm thinking, this isn't good. What are you going to do? I met some German girls. Um, we went for a coffee down by the sauna in, in Sweden, so, so European. Down by the sauna, yeah. Uh, and they're telling me, like, they, one girl was living in a van, like, pretty, pretty boho there, but like, it's like, I had an extra tent if you want to sit in the tent. I'm like, that could be a temporary measure, right? Tent school. Like, there's a rule in Sweden where you can tent over common land. So in Sweden, you can tent camp by the water for a few days and there's no issue there. Like, kind of like squatting, I guess, but not as dirty and grimy and shit, right? So I'm like, cool, that's great. So I'd, I'd sleep in the tent, bring my luggage to the train station, put it in the locker for the day. And the day I come back, grab my bag, and bring it back to the tent. Hopefully no one moved in. Hopefully no one moved in. I slept there for two nights. Until one day, my classmate heard that I had, was living in my tent. He said, hey, Dan, you want to sleep on my floor? I said, hell yeah, bud. I want to sleep on your floor for sure. But that's the story of me moving to Malmo, just like fast and loose, no real plans. But I didn't want to just say, hey, I can't make it work because there's no housing situation here. I managed to find a house after that. I moved around quite a bit in Malmo, three places. But that's one that I um, kind of showcased. Hey, I was a bit resilient before this happened because I managed to make that work. And mind you, like, worst case scenario, I probably could have moved home to Vancouver would have been the worst case in the world, right? But it was like, no, I said moving to Sweden. And I'm moving back here because I screwed up the hospital bookings and stuff like this. Like, I'll make it work. Um, this guy, bottom left, this is me, if you can't tell. This is the guy I morph into when I come on stage, Danny Mack, I call him. My name is Danny McQueen. Danny Mack's my guy, like David Goggins. Have you heard of David Goggins before? Yeah. So Goggins is a monster. But I really respect him. He's able to morph into this character, David Goggins morphs into Goggins. And Goggins is a bad mother, man. And he doesn't take any crap. Will do what he says he's going to do. He's like very channels this inner rage and this I'm going to prove you wrong vibe. So when I need to get piped up and pumped up, do something like this, I morph into Danny Mac. And this is my guy here. Now, the start line. So finish as you'd like to begin. Okay? So everything I do in life now is finish as you'd like to begin. So the whoop strap, when it runs out of batteries, I charge it. When that's done, I always charge it in so it's ready to go the next time I want to use it. In the evening, when I, when I finish up in the kitchen, I'll wipe the whole kitchen down, spotless on the counters, because I want to walk into a clean kitchen in the morning. Finish as you like to begin with everything. Um, so when you get started the next day, there's no barrier to entry. There's no build up to like, oh, I got to clean the kitchen first before I can make breakfast. Like, no, the kitchen's clean. It's done. Finish as you like to begin. Timers on your phone. So everyone's got a phone. Hopefully they haven't checked it too much during the stop today. I don't know. But you got the, the phone for two main reasons, okay? Timers and alarms. Alarm my phone. I've got an email Marta yesterday, and I'll email her at 6.45. I'll send an alarm my phone. Email Marta about final leg for the talking gig. Speaking gig. When the alarm goes off, I check the notes on my phone. What's the alarm in relation to? No mark. Timers on my phone, conversely. You've got, you know, you're scrolling Instagram before you go to bed. Give yourself 15 minutes. When the timer goes off, respect the timer. Make the phone work for you. Uh, I'll watch hockey for 20 minutes before I go to bed. Set the timer for 20 minutes. My phone now does a frog note when it goes off on the timer. It's obnoxious as all hell, but I love it because it's all swore the hairy frog vibes. But it's a reminder like, hey, you said it was over, it's over. Respect the phone, respect the timers. Uh, the tattoo, the back of my leg, the ship. I did a full day session with Danny Cuopo in, in London. He's a big tattoo artist. The second tattoo I got, 
The second he put the first prick in the back of my leg, I knew this was a mistake. I did it too far down my leg, it's right on my knee, it's just horrible. Horrible. What can you do? You shut the hell up. So you can't muck up that tattoo, right? Make a choice, stick with it. I would tell him, how far are we in the tattoo, Danny? About 40% boss, 35% boss. Danny, is that it? It looks like we're higher than that. I'd ask him to kind of incrementally tell me percentage-wise how we're doing. Let me mentally get through the all-day session with him. But back of the leg, man, back of the knee, that hurt like a mother. Podcasts. Uh, I'm a big podcast guy. Does anyone like podcasts? Here? Anyone like podcasts? Yeah. What podcast we listening to? German ones. Sorry. German podcast. Danke. <laughs> uh, I love podcast self improvement ones, hockey ones, spin chickles. Anyone listen to spin chickles? Spin and chickles. Yeah. Uh, I love those. I love Tim Ferriss. Huberman. Huberman's great. Joe Rogan. I love these guys. They're they're great because they like, they force me to be better than yesterday. So podcasts, like now I can't do so much visual stuff because the eyes are wobbly and the delusion makes me difficult to take it on, but I can podcast and when I have my hands free, my eyes free to like look at the world and around me, it's, it's amazing. I feel a bit superior, I'll be honest. On the two, everyone's looking at their phone, I'm just sitting there and looking at everyone with my headphones on. I got this, man, it's cool. Uh, podcasts are great. Find one that work for you and just embrace that. Let me have one more and then we'll end for questions. Are there any more questions? Uh, what do we got else here? Fika. So Fika is Swedish for coffee break and something I picked up while studying in Sweden. Fika is a, a chance to have a walk, a fresh air, change of environment, grab a cake, grab a coffee, have a chat with a friend, chimwag. It's a vibe. Fika is a vibe. And I would be notorious in London for always putting Fikas in people's calendars like, hey, we're going for Fika this afternoon. The house is bloody fika me. It's like, well, it's a chance to have a chat with Dan to go for coffee. I get to embrace the battery. This is how I refresh myself from a stagnant day of like being in front of the computer. So, are there any final questions before we end the call talk for the day? Please. Um, with your double vision, how do you do? You have difficulties reading, like you, you say you listen to podcasts. Is it difficult for you to pick up a book and read, or to be able to, if you're reading something and actually understand it, to go back and reread? Or um, yeah, thanks for the question. It's uh, something I've learned to deal with. Initially, it was quite abrasive and difficult. Like, I would be like, I guess I can't read anymore. But you find a way to do amazing things. It's like, uh, like, I have two videos of this room playing at the same time. They're not merging into one of my brain. It's quite taxed on my vibe, right? So it's taking some adjustments, for sure, but it's not a death blow. And like anything in this world, like, you learn to adapt with it. But I do podcasts now because it's easier to digest that than it is to do visual stuff. I still have YouTube for like how to do stuff. I'm still visual and not perspective, but like for a lot of stuff I just do audio now, which is great. But it's not, um, I had surgery on the eyes two months ago. Made them better, but didn't fix the double vision. Having surgery on the other eye in a month or two. Uh, and that'll hopefully make it better again. But it's, it's ongoing with the double vision. It's not not going to go away unless it like magically melts and goes into one vision and you're sorted out from there. But um, yeah, thank you for the question. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you all for your time. Martin, I appreciate you. If you want to connect with me, you can scan the QR code here. This is my LinkedIn. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Dan, thank you. I don't know if I speak for everyone in the room, but I think you've definitely earned some street cred here at Olive Room. So <laughs> uh, that was super inspiring and super motivating. And I love to listen to the stories. I don't know if you guys did too, but uh, that was awesome. Thanks, thank you. Appreciate thank that. you for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cool. Awesome. Appreciate you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to come to me afterwards. I'm happy to chat too, as well. It's been intimidating to me melt your questions out in front of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.